Zoe. Yes, my darling. I would like to discuss, or at least start discussing, what you use as your alter ego, Nomi, mm-hmm. which is lace pattern mm-hmm. motif. Why that patternistic, why did you consider that patternistic form as your alter ego? What was it about that motif that attracted you? Right. Um, well, I guess I've been, um, there's the alter ego that um, I, I guess, conjured or gave a name to some years ago when I was doing Jungian psychology. And, and that was a time when I was feeling very spiritually and creatively trapped and held back by patriarchal forces in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was working with someone who was trying to encourage me to access an energy within myself that was unchanged by external forces. And um, we were looking at the shadow, which is a Jungian concept. And he was like, you know, this force, your shadow, like she's risen up and fought for you in the past and she's gotten you out of sticky situations and she creates your work for you she gave birth for you etc and I was like okay I started to picture this wild woman bigger than me stronger than me more powerful than me and Mm -hmm. I gave her the name Nomi as you know um and then I kind of feel like after this was some years ago I kind of feel like I forgot about her a little bit. And though she's been present in everything that I've done since, and she's definitely been with me on life's journey since then, uh, God knows she's had to rise up and fight for me also. Um, I haven't like cognizantly been making an effort to connect with her. So when the pandemic hit, and of course we were all limited and held back, Mm -hmm. I was very viscerally reminded of like, hang on a minute, there's an energy within me that is free all the time. And it felt very apt um, to start creating work from a more intuitive place. And as I know you know, I work so often with domestic textiles. Um, And so specifically the doilies, as you asked, those lace round forms, to me, they feel like brains. Um, And when we look at them, we think about maybe our mothers, maybe our grandmothers, they feel very explicitly feminine and of the home and fragile. But to me, they also conjure this idea of the right and left brain and using ink, you can kind of make them bleed and, and leak and come together or using very tight mohair thread, I can kind of explore this idea of, of trauma being stuck in between the left and right sides of the brain. Mm. And so that is a very long winded way of saying that. Oh no, that's <laughs> actually fascinating. It's even more fascinating because I kind of want to follow up because one of the things that I was really fascinated by is how you use the know me, not only conceptually in your work, but as a material guide, mm. because mm-hmm. obviously it's it's steeped in a process of making. Yeah. But then I was caught up in the patternations of it because it's like, it's a very singular, very recognizable motif. Mm-hmm. And I thought of it as almost like a meditative state, sort of mm-hmm. like the vibrations. And it's really interesting that you said, or you linked it to the brain, because mm-hmm. I thought it was something that felt very instinctive to you mm-hmm. and a meditative state, because so much of what I think you play with is the powerful forces that you described of patriarchy, violence, trauma. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's so many things, especially in ancient cultures or indigenous cultures that employ that kind of, not the, the nomi, but that kind of um, patternation in order to deal with life, in mm-hmm. order to sort of take all of these uncontrollable forces and kind of I don't say diluted. What's the word I'm looking for? Like you want to put it into a place that is controlled. Yes. Yeah. That is understood. And it's translated in a way that, you know, your brain and your emotional self and, and your well-being in a way can, can kind of deal with that and, and have it be in that place. And so I wondered if you were using it, not just for that purpose, but also for the audience. Yes. To sort of take a lot of that heavy stuff and like put it into a form 
mm-hmm. that is accessible to them. Yeah, and is mm-hmm. and does speak is archetypal. Like we've got mandalas, we've got you know so mm-hmm. much of these um, these curving snake um, motifs. Yeah, yeah, speak to like a kundalini, but also speak mm-hmm. to you know. Um, deities for fertility and goddesses and whatnot and then also it's it's interesting what you've touched upon because it makes me think about I remember my mother telling me of this like old I think religious adage that um, which is fucked up by the way it's that (laughs) um, woman is a piece of silk a man is a piece of gold and if you drop Mm -hmm. gold in the dirt no problem just dust it off but if Mm -hmm. you drop a piece of silk in the dirt it's ruined forever and that's Mm -hmm. so loaded obviously about chastity and perfection Mm -hmm. and you know all of these things that still bind us Mm -hmm. um as women um but that that's something that really um encouraged me to look more at materials silks linens um lace for that very idea this this notion that if it's stained it's ruined and you can't get it out but you and i know the stains are what make these things remarkable and beautiful and that's that's where the story is you know yeah there is a beautiful i mean i'm just looking at your amazing work and I'm just really struck by how the figure has been introduced. You have been playing with the figure or the figuration in mm. your work very tentatively, yes. if I'm correct, yeah, in the past. Yeah. It seems like you're you're leaning into it more and more. Yeah. But you're doing it in such a way that it's almost like the figure, the figure is unreliable mm-hmm. in these. Yeah. It's almost like they're they're just barely there and then they can go away at any moment. It's yeah. like they're, it's like, a, like you said, the stain, but the stain itself is unreliable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's completely figure. uncontrollable. Mm. And even the process, so you're absolutely right. This is the first time that I've actually been literally using forms, um, mm. women, us dancing, raving, pictures, mm-hmm. um, that people had taken of me praying in India and then these predatory animals. Um, and the process of, of ink staining on the fabric, you know, I, I wet the fabric, I do the embroidery, I wet the fabric and then I drop ink onto it. And then I have no idea what's gonna happen because mm-hmm. it just very quickly bleeds out and has its own life. And like us can't be controlled, like us can't be, um, you know, diminished or, or made to go over here like it will she will rape (laughs) do you know what I mean and so yeah I've really I've really enjoyed it's good for me who someone who is a control freak and can be a perfectionist it's good for me to have a practice where I'm like okay here we go kiss it up to God like we'll see when it dries what happened with this piece you know you're letting that process dictate how the picture is going to come out in the end exactly but I also would reason why I asked what what I meant by unreliable is that somehow you obscure the figure you obscure the snake you know mm-hmm. you obscure any sort of like completed picture or yes. completed figuration mm-hmm. everything has to be has this obfuscation yeah. that we cannot fully see the form mm-hmm. and I yeah. wondered what that was about I think that for me is very much about um transformation and and a shedding of the skin and the fact that I feel that we're all in progress beings like we're not complete we're figuring this out and that's what makes us beautiful so the threads are loose and they're coming down and some things some parts of the bodies or the animals are are obscured by the ink itself and they look like they're emerging from or actually swallowed up by um I've also been embroidering with white thread as well and you can Mm -hmm. barely see that um Mm -hmm. there's such a expectation I think also coming out of 2020 you know which is when you made this work Mm. that people need something certain Mm -hmm. there was a craving for certainty there was a craving for a common ground Mm -hmm. and one thing that I've noticed with your work is that it's almost like easing people out of that idea. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's no common ground at all. Yeah. There's a psychology 
aspect of our lives, Mm -hmm. which is very mercurial, which is very much unreliable. And it's constantly changing. It's like history. It's constantly undoing itself and reaffirming itself. And then you have the material. So there's a story of that, Mm. which, you know, bleeds into all kinds of things, societal expectations, you know, the implications of being a woman in Mm. our time. But then there's the material story that I'm really, really fascinated by because it's very delicate Mm. and subtle. You know, your work isn't hard hitting with the exception, of course, of the gloves, which I, I want to get into a little bit later, but <laughs> I'm looking at a lot of the, for instance, I'm looking at slow dancing, white embossed ovals mm-hmm. through my veins, which mm-hmm. is a, like a serpent, you know, a snake that's coming through. And then it looks like, I'm guessing there's another lace mm-hmm. over it. Yeah. Something imprinted over it mm-hmm. that obscures the form completely from our view. So we can only yeah. see parts of the snake. Yeah. And it's not just that. There's other uh, pictures where that same kind of like, placement of something over it mm-hmm. Com- it, it like it alters our idea or our expectations about oh why can't we see this completely mm-hmm. is exactly. it because our perspective is is um blocked we mm-hmm. can't access that information mm-hmm. because that's just the way that life is that's how our psychology is that's how we process information how we how we understand ourselves mm-hmm. how we understand the world mm-hmm. how do we understand the motives of others yeah, absolutely. and I wonder, am I reading into it? No, you're there? you're dead on, babe. You're dead on. Oh, um, I'm glad because I don't want to <laughs> put in projection. No, you're dead on. Um, yeah, that particular piece of text was speaking to a time when my um, I was not fully conscious because of Xanax and alcohol, and I experienced mm. um, violence and from the hands of someone I would never have expected that from. And so speaking to this idea of like, not being fully conscious and aware of what's in front of us and having um, one's consent um, Mm. um, taken and and reformed. and, And then by using the snake and making the snake almost like pregnant or, it also reminded me of, um, you know those images of snakes that like when they eat their prey and then they <laughs> they look like a normal snake but then with this giant thing in their tummy oh um, god you know i'm like wait is, there, is, this just, is this like just a very full up snake um but no you're right it's it's mm. also um looking at, at layers of obscurity and there are two different pieces of textiles there and and then obviously the collage bit and the text as well um and I guess like the space in between that slippage in between of Mm. and and allowing there to also be space visually for the viewer to um draw their own conclusions absolutely absolutely I mean I love that you open up not only in the terms of how the work is constructed but how it, the meanings that are attached to the work, it's really opened up to the viewer to kind of impart their own experience and their own interpretations, which I think is very powerful and very like, it seems to me, cause I need to, I gotta ask it. Okay. Poetry mm-hmm. is very important to you. Yes. In the titles of the work, in, in the actual work itself, there's words that are woven into the image. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me maybe about your relationship to poetry. It says here that you have been doing an ongoing poem mm-hmm. titled, um, and let me make sure I got this correct, Show Me Show Your me Bruises, your bruises. Then, yeah. which is like an ongoing sort of uh, uh, project that mm-hmm. you have incorporated through multiple exhibitions and multiple series. Yes. Um, What is the role of poetry for you, not only in the making of the work, but how you kind of like process your ideas? Yeah, great question. Thank you, babe. So I I grew up, you know, my mom was this acting teacher and this Shakespeare expert. So I grew up with um, the art of language and literature very much within the home. Um, But as you know, I also grew up in East London where, the predominant culture was hip hop, whether it's American hip hop or like British hip hop and beat poetry was a big thing. And so it was just very 
linguistically rich my upbringing I've always loved and really appreciated words cuss words swear words language I'm I'm all for it um and then in 2018 I was asked to write for a, a newspaper uh, they asked me for a 300 word essay on my experience of 2018 and they said to me you can make it as abstract as you want now if you tell an artist that they will run with that idea right <laughs> yeah so <laughs> don't tell us abstract no no like we'll do that so I got all excited and I put together this like little mini essay where I was weaving together snippets of conversations and things that people had said to me, like other women sharing and things that I had said or had been told by men. And all the text was pertaining to bleeding, bruising or having your power taken away from you. And I submitted it to the newspaper and they were like, absolutely not this is way too abstract. Can you please write us something much more basic? So right. I went, okay, no surprises there. But so I, I wrote them something else, but then I had like the beginning of something that I thought was pretty rich there and, and quite fertile ground for expression. So I started to embroider that text. Um, and again, this was some years ago. And since then, really, I've just been expanding the poem. Um, it's now called Show Me Your Bruises Then. And it's um, it's got a lot. It's got a lot going on in yeah, there. It's very powerful words. And I, I think that's what I meant by like process of thinking. It's almost as if we're, it's like sometimes the way that the words are incorporated into the draw, I mean, I keep calling drawings. That's what we're You know, in my mind. <laughs> but uh, I, I sense that like there, it's like you're exposing a, a stream of consciousness, mm. yes, you know, so. mantra um, work. And, and this idea of like, they're just like these moments that you might like catch on a subway, mm -hmm. you know, like eavesdropping and it goes away. Yes. You know, or like you're, you're walking down a street and you might hear like a conversation pass you and mm -hmm. you turn and it's gone. Right, right, and, absolutely. Um, but you like trap them mm -hmm. in these, these these works. And we have the luxury as a viewer to be privy to these moments, these thoughts, these ideas, mm -hmm. this lexicon, because yeah. they feel very much like idiosyncratic too. You very know, because so. they're, you know what I mean? They're like parts of all these different dialogues, whether they be internal in ourselves mm -hmm. or just between other people. And suddenly it's like, we have access to that. But yet mm -hmm. the, again, Con juxtaposition that with the forms of people we don't see fully right so right. it's like this like cross section of two things where the words and the images together are not at opposition but it's almost as if like there's something that is accessible and there's just certain things that you don't know and you have right. to put it on faith you right. just gotta like make up what your meaning is mm -hmm. from your vantage point Absolutely. It doesn't mean your vantage point is invalid. It doesn't mean that your vantage point is wrong, mm -hmm. but it means that this is where you're at. This right. is the space you're in. Right. How do you create meaning from that space? Right. Absolutely. It's something that I know that you're, um, that you examine in your work, like most recently with your show. Um, tell me, a, tell me a story. I don't care. Oh, I don't truth. care if it's true. Yeah. I <laughs> fucking love that series, Toy, and I'm all about oh, that. Oh, thank you so much. Where there's this space, where there's this visual space, but there's this like symbolic space where it's really it's up to us. And um, I feel that there are pieces where I'm also trying to push that, like. Um, there's, there's a work in this series that says, you're walking fine to me. It looks like you're walking fine to me, I think. Oh, yes, and, um, yes. You know, I've had people be like, oh, that's like a cat call. Or like, that's when, I remember <laughs> Cleo's babysitter being like, that's when the guy wants to keep going and you don't want to keep going. And they're like, Ooh. please, you look like you're walking fine to me. Or is it something much more sinister? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm, I'm interested Beautiful in work, things right? that, yeah, like things that you can overhear or, or something that someone can say in a throw, throwaway manner mm -hmm. that is actually incredibly loaded, incredibly complex and um, complicated. And then there are other works where I feel I'm putting, I guess, more of a, a pointed poetic voice into the, into the piece. Mm -hmm. um, there's one called Reality's Form, and it's like, it's these honeycomb shape um, doilies presented. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, and it says, um, 
can't, I can't remember. Actually. Did that split second switch split second reminding switch her of, realities, of the realities form? Of realities form, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that to me, like I've been thinking a lot about um, the familial and almost nostalgic feeling of when you know that you're not safe. Um, and I've been reflecting back recently on on how that is something that almost like a sixth sense or a second skin or what have you. It's like, I know this feeling so well. Like I've seen it since I'm three years old. It's, it's in the living room. It's in the first job I ever got as a junior, you mm. know, in a hair salon. It's in the workplace, it's outside the club. Or even as a grown ass woman, it's in my own home when my baby's sleeping next door. You get me? But it's that mm. awareness when you're like, oh you're about to switch and when you switch I am yet again let down by the fact that I am in the smaller body why am I always in the fucking smaller body for this shit you know and I I know like you know I I get big in in uh, moments of conflict I'll always try and and um you know, get loud, get Larry or swear or whatever, or try and like diffuse the situation by maybe making them back down. And then there has unfortunately been moments throughout my life where I've gone, I'm not going to win this. Why? Because Mm. I'm in the fucking, that's the reality of my form. Mm. Here I am again. I can't get out of this. Mm. And so, you know, there are pieces in this series where I'm really looking at and talking in, in in more specific ways about what it is to be in a woman's body um in relationship to other men Mm, and the power dynamics in Mm -hmm. that i think one of the things that i'm really glad that you mentioned that because i sense from this series specifically um a sort of like and i'm trying to be very careful with this because I don't sense in any way that your work is about powerlessness. Mm -hmm, I do not. Mm -mm. I do not sense that it is an angry, there is anger in the work, but it's not an angry series as a whole. Mm -hmm. What I sense is this is the experience of, and I love this, the reality of my form. I love that phrase, but this idea that this person, me, you, Anyone who's been marginalized, anyone who's ever been afraid Mm -hmm. and feels like they don't have ownership of their body, that that is in the hands of another person, Mm -hmm. that experience, it's not even that it's the trauma of that, but everyone knows the feeling of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it happens in, in, you know, the earliest memory, right? Is the fear, fight or flight, right? Right. That is when you're like, I have to protect my body because I know that now I don't control whether or not. I, it'll be safe. Mm-hmm. Why I keep coming back to the piece gully. Oh, gully. Yeah. And I keep thinking about that feeling that we all kind of have, or we become cognizant of when we're very young, maybe like five, mm-hmm. six years old, 10 years old, you know, max. And suddenly we're like, I don't have ownership of this body. Mm-hmm. Someone else has ownership of it, control of it, power over it, mm-hmm. all of those things. Yes. And because of that, the meaning of my body in whatever space it is, is like up to, it's subject to anything. Mm-hmm. It yeah. can be absolved and subsumed into anything. Yes. It can be tainted. You know, there's so many levels to this. Yeah. yeah. But the thing that I really wanted to focus on is meaning because mm-hmm. meaning is power. Mm-hmm. And if you register the meaning of your body in a space being threatened, mm-hmm that changes how you interact within that space and with others. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm looking at Gully and I, I mean, immediately that was the first thing I, I, I don't know, something about this piece stopped me in my tracks. Oh, wow. It was about this thing about the way the, the mohairs, and I'm guessing it's also a staining effect in yeah. the materiality of it. First of all, girl, go off. But <laughs> it's just like the way that it just subtly bleeds into that the motif of the the collage motif Mm. and it's like it's like in process Mm -hmm. midway and we just you snatched it you captured that yeah and I think that that was something in my mind again this is just my interpretation 
But in that moment, I thought that's in our brains when we realize things can go in any way yeah. at any moment. I can be subsumed at any moment. Yeah. And most people, let's be clear, who are in power don't know that feeling very well. No, exactly. It's usually people who aren't in, you know, who have been taken, who have, you know, who have had violences put upon them that mm -hmm. have been refugees of some kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They know that feeling instinctively. They yeah. know exactly what that is. Exactly. But suddenly 2020 happened. Mm hmm and then everybody had that feeling. <laughs> it was True. like you couldn't get away with it, you know? It. And it. so now it's like, wait, what, what, is, what is the ground I stand on? Mm -hmm. What is the most reliable foundation I have? And 2020 was like, honey, none. We're on a rock floating in space. What do you think is reliable? Right. Nothing. Right. Yeah. And then what I love is that you call attention to that. Again, I could be projecting. Please correct me. No, no, you're, you're right on so many levels, babe. I mean, first of all, I feel that this is the most joyful work I've ever made, honestly. Mm. <laughs> and though there is... <laughs> I feel like maybe I'm taking <laughs> it. No, no, you're <laughs> absolutely <laughs> right. You're absolutely right. Though there is, of course, with the text and with a lot of it, there is, I'm speaking about trauma, I'm speaking about domination, I'm speaking about violence um, in all its forms. I am also looking at joy and exaltation, love, freedom, our capacity to go through the things that we go through and still throw down in, in, in a nightclub and <laughs> use our bodies in that way, you know, to celebrate our forms and the reality of our forms, you know? And so often with, with the images, um, whether it's someone uh, twerking or praying, there's this kind of, um, I'm looking at the way um, often our bodies are in the same positions, whether you're um, in encountering violence or whether you're throwing your hands up in the air celebrating, you know, is someone mm -hmm. screaming or are they in ecstasy? Is that an orgasm? Or is that um, a situation where there's violence and domination? And so you're pretty dead on with all of that, honestly. Um, yeah, and that piece yeah. really is, is very much looking at these bodies emerging out of this motif where there's this kind of like this this darkness and this yeah, and it's down. dripping down. But yeah. I don't see it as nefarious at all. I no. think it's actually quite like almost comforting it for yeah. me at least. I, yeah. I felt that it was almost like this is this is what it is. Yeah. It doesn't need to explain itself. Mm -hmm. It's just that is the truth. That is truth. <laughs> and then this beautiful like sort of um uh border this red border around mm. the edge and i mean a, a gorgeously done and then of course that 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 staining effect at the bottom that gradually creeps up mm. so there's always a thin line between violence and joy you know it's yeah. like so, you know it could go either way yeah. um at the at literally the turn of a dime which again is back to that idea of like nothing is certain you know mm. you, you don't know even in situations that could be a safe space can turn into something very different very yes. quickly. Yeah, 100%. Um I guess going off of that, the violence, the you know that that sort of like tilting of the coin, violence and joy, I want to go into the, the boxing gloves, mm -hmm. yeah. which is what you're most known for. I find yeah. that that was what really set off your career because mm -hmm. you were able to take or sort of mitigate really two very powerful sensations, you know, the masculine and feminine, the, you know, what is joy and, and violence, um, the things that are very intimate, and then the things that are also very public. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like those uh, gloves often straddle both worlds very seamlessly, I think. Mm -hmm. And I wondered in these, in this series, you're, you've taken a, them into a further space because mm -hmm. the materiality of how they're made in the past when I first saw them and I was just blown away was the wedding dresses. They were wow. made up of wedding dresses that you had assembled. The material choices for these gloves, how did they shift for you in this series? Yeah, so I've been, um, oh God, thank you, babe, by the way. Um, I've been looking um, a lot more at the home 
and mm -hmm. and domesticity and so all of the fabrics in this series on the gloves and in the on the flatworks too are um some kind of domestic textile whether that's a hanky or mm -hmm. a tablecloth a table runner um the one with the red border that you speak of that's actually those belong to my mom so mm -hmm. it's yeah super meaningful for me to use those and I, and I also used um because she gave me a little set I don't know who they belonged to like I'm guessing my grandmother but I used that same um fabric on these two gloves that where one is balancing on the other um and those to me with with these glove clusters and sculptures like some of them you've got um gloves sort of facing the same way and almost like supporting each other mm -hmm. and, um, or like a little a, a pair that's very much that, right yeah. exactly and and they can feel like um two pieces that you know perhaps a uh, even in love or there's an intimacy between one and the other and then you've the got right exactly absolutely mm -hmm. and then you've got some where there's one is that one pulling the other down or yes is that, I was like yeah right, is that something yeah. actually lifting someone up and out um mm. for me I I started to make those works um or I guess flip them for the first time the gloves when my mum was terminally ill and I wasn't really thinking about it too deeply at the time. I was obviously I had quite quite a lot on my mind. But I look back at that now and I and I really think about how there was someone slipping away from me and I was desperate to hold on to that person. Um, and there's that kind of, I don't know, that like that anxiety of something being balanced on the other and and not knowing if it's about to fall or when it's going to fall. Um, so that work is is very much um, about the home, a lot about my mum, but also shared experiences that I've had with my mother um, to do with, yeah, again, the home and power. Was the material, the fabric itself, dictating the narratives and how you mm. position these gloves and how you were trying to create different like um situations with them mm -hmm. or was it already in your mind and you were just using the fabric to sort of extend that or to kind of like find a way for the fabric to help you manifest right create this narrative right so often um when something arrives in the studio so I, I collect these vintage fabrics exactly um as you said because they come to me already with a history and with, already with their own stories mm -hmm. and then from that I I may have an idea of something that I want to make but it's not really until it's there in the studio that I can see you know well does it have stains what's going on over here what happens if I rip it what happens if I cut it um, the two pieces that you reference, I'm uh, absolutely looking at this idea of the earth, um, you know, whether it's like almost like snake like bits of fabric coming down or those flowers on that piece and Ganga water glistens. That's very much, um, I guess, inspired by or informed by the experience of taking my mother's ashes to India where I offered them back to the Himalayan Ganges, which is said, which by the way is freezing cold water. I got in after I did it. Um, but it's said, that water is said to be pure spiritual feminine energy. And that when you put um, ashes into the water, it's, um, I guess, putting the mother back into the mother. They call, they call it Mother Ganga, the river. Um, and those fabrics, those were my mum's. Um, and so those flowers and trailing away and, and trickling down really reminded me of the way her ashes, which were so much, I'd never done this before. They were so much lighter in color than I expected them to be. And they were, when I poured them in with my daughter Cleo by my side, they made these really beautiful swirling patterns and they quite swiftly like danced away downstream. Mm -hmm. And um, it was stunning. I think it was definitely one of the most memorable moments in my life, of my life. And then, and then I got in and girl, I dunked like traditionally when you take a ceremonial dunk oh, in the right. water, you go back three times. 
Mm. And on the third, like immersion into the water, I opened my eyes and thought about the fact that within this water actually is the remnants of my mom's body. Like it's still, right. it's still got to be like some kind it's of surrounding you yeah. article somewhere. And I opened my eyes and I saw this flash of light and it was so cold. I'm pretty sure that my heart might have stopped and that I died and was reborn at least that's oh my gosh <laughs> that's, that's how I felt, felt. Wow. I came out of that like hands in the air like whoa like, I felt like I was on fire when I came out of the water mm. um that's, so it was wow. it was a a very formative moment and journey and that's what started my year I went in January 2020 mm. so my year started with like offering back and ceremonial bathes in the water and rebirth and all of this like good shit and transition and then came back to the to the lockdown and was like all right let's get to work what was the effect of the bleeding ink wash yeah yeah that's that I see often what yeah. was it about that because it, it appears mm-hmm. in, in different works in different ways and I wondered what that was for you in the making and why you chose it yeah so you know you're you're right I'd never used ink before um or any paint in any way right right. um and then you know lockdown hits and of course I'm thinking a lot about my mum and you know where she was a writer she also would like I remember there was like a period in like the 90s where she really it was all about fountain pens like Mm -hmm. and that would almost like excite her like getting a new fountain pen and like (laughs) she and her things would start to smell of ink Mm -hmm. um and and I associate her little room and that smell with her and her creation and then also like her demons and her trauma um and then of course there's this thing she told me that she was examining in her work about this idea of of woman as a as a piece of silk ruined by dirt um so it felt very um apt to start um I mean I, I literally just Amazon primed some fountain pen ink opened it up and was like oh my god this smell yes let's go um but yeah it felt it felt very apt to start um to start staining the fabrics with the ink. Oh, because I the reason I ask is because that also adds to that idea of this image is not fully formed. Mm-hmm. This image is constantly being undone and redone mm-hmm. because its meaning is being undone and redone. Absolutely. And you know that was that was what 2020 was. Yeah. Meaning became very suspect. What were words in mm-hmm. 2020? What were images in 2020? Nothing seemed to, there was no consensus. There was nothing, (laughs) absolutely. There was nothing to take shelter of Mm. but your own self and your own relationship with yourself or your relationship to the divine or, or, you know, the things that, nothing was certain I didn't even know if there was going to be an art world there was a minute where I was like I mean well my career is fucked hello you know what I mean so I was like well and then I (laughs) and then I stopped and I thought but I've never made my artwork for the art world anyway Mm -hmm. (laughs) like I've never made work for the for a a gallery or to sell it or for or for people to write about it that's never that's never been my motivation so why am I going to stop now and in fact I found it really like fertile time creatively um and and a time where we were all given a moment to connect very deeply with the things that we do find certain and joyful and free within ourselves and I became so like abundantly impressed by and inspired by the women in my life yourself included who I I just think it's amazing that I have found and continue to seek out relationships with women who all have a firm relationship with their inner wilderness you know with their own know me in in whatever context and whatever form Mm -hmm. um so I feel like this work is it's a celebration of of me and you and and all of us and and our capacity to like overcome and and resist I just looked at the images yesterday and then I read the text this morning and the one thing that I really wanted to talk to you about is this idea of how your works feel ancient because of the vintage, again, the materials that you mm. use, but also very new. 
at the same time, sim- you know, simultaneously ancient, old, weathered, you mm-hmm. know, full of history, but also at the same time, because of the way you collage things, the juxtapositions of meaning and literally how these forms are um, comprised, mm-hmm. feel very fresh and very new and very prescient. Your work, and please correct me, this is wrong, but it helps us ease into death. Mm. I feel, I feel like that's, that's, that's the greatest compliment. Scary. It's not scary to me. Thank you, know? you mate. You know what I mean? Like that's something that's that's literally been the human story since time immemorial. Yeah. So like, it's not like it's you know, but it's for some reason we we became invincible in twenty the twenty first century. Yeah. Like nothing can harm us. We're everything technology. The world is so fast. Da, da, da. No, we could die at any time. Yes, wow. we can be harmed at mm-hmm. any time. So what is meaning now with mm-hmm. that knowledge? Yeah, with that exactly. truth. Yeah. And I, that meaning is what you choose. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm about that. I think that um the first um the first solo show that I ever had, I was it was actually right after I had um given birth. And I was honestly, Toyin, I was consumed with um thoughts of death, not suicidal thoughts, but just mm-hmm. this this notion that hang on a minute, I've made life and I think she's perfect and I and she's gonna die. Like I was I hold my my newborn baby and was like, yeah, she'll die. Like that's actually fact, bruv. And I'm going to and that Facts. person is over there and that person is and shit. Like mm-hmm. everything that lives yes. dies. That's life. That's the human condition. Mm-hmm. And therefore I have to find beauty in that. Do you know what I mean? Like it has to be because it's fucked up. So it has to also be like fucked up and beautiful, right. fucked up and fascinating. Um, and so, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting that I've sort of circled back um, in the last couple of years and the last two series of works to, as you say, to, to death, really, um, to mortality. And so I love you for seeing that because not a lot of people see that in the work. And I really appreciate that. That's some that's nuanced. I mean, I, I think it's a gift that you've given people because some somebody might go through this work on, on many levels. They're beautiful, you know, just aesthetically. There's a language that aesthetic, the nomi that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. There's also a history to the materials and a meaning to the materials, narrative meaning mm-hmm. the materials that you use. That's an access point for people. But I also sense at the heart coming out of when you made it, coming out of what you've experienced and what we've all kind of collectively experienced is this idea that yes, nothing is certain, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what you choose to do with the time you are allotted right now is the definitive. That's all the meaning you need. Mm. You don't need to seek it in all these other things. Mm. Right now, this choice you make. And I thought I love it, and I want to end it on this one. Yes, tell on me. On a positive, maybe I could have been more peaceful. <laughs> yes, that piece because it's the most. I mean, there's a few pieces that are explicitly text, but mm-hmm. that one is very interesting to me because you you bring in the leaf. It's like a a, a sort of foliage mm-hmm. that comes that grows out. Yeah, peaceful, and then yeah. just kind of, again just gently cascades down Mm -hmm. that's when I knew at least for my sense that you were like holding our hands with this like all right I'm about to let go of your hand (laughs) like this is life let's go tell me a little bit about that that piece is is very much about me um taking those words um that have been said to me and owning them and like rewriting them and making them beautiful. Mm. I wanted to ask about that piece because I actually feel that is a very beautiful sort of prayer Mm. to oneself. Oh, I love that. And thank you for that. Thank you for this incredible body of work, for your rigor, Uh. for your investigative mind. And listen, in the art world that we exist in, <laughs> where there are so many presentations, you have sculpture in here, you have painting, embroidery, 
you've incorporated so many different processes and mediums and that in itself is an amazing accomplishment and uh, you know what oh my good ass and I think that you know the fact that you keep pushing it you keep growing you're learning with each series mm, that's mm, exciting absolutely. to me and I see nothing but greatness to come sis girl okay. thank you so much Truly.